The year is coming to a close, and one of the kind of traditional things that happens during this time of year is Time releases a bunch of different lists and articles kind of just reviewing what happened over the last year. But because this is the end of 2019, they're also releasing articles talking about things over the past decade. And something I want to talk a little bit about is their list of the 10 most important gadgets of this decade. Now, I'm not going to talk about every single thing on the list, but there are two specific things related to gaming I want to go over. And these aren't ranked in any order, by the way, either. It's just 10 things that are shaping the decade. And for gaming, the two representatives they listed were the Nintendo Switch and the Xbox Adaptive Controller. And the reason I find these listings interesting is because when you're coming from a background of video games and looking at what's kind of been going on the last decade, a lot of times people boil down the console atmosphere to being the three companies, Xbox, Nintendo, and PlayStation. And if you didn't notice, one of those does not have a product on this list. And this isn't to say that PlayStation's a bad thing, there's just, I think, very important reasons and kind of implications to look at why nothing they've released over this past decade qualifies for this list. So first, let's just kind of break down the two that came in and why they're important. First, let's talk about the Nintendo Switch. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I think this made the list. They, of course, have their own little blurb talking about why it's important. And the really big thing, honestly, especially from someone who's been, you know, just playing games for a long time, is that this really has been the system that caused a reemergence not only for Nintendo, but also for the concept of portable gaming. You know, for a long time, while Nintendo and PlayStation as well were putting out handheld systems, there's this kind of ongoing argument of, like, when will mobile phones replace these? Because phone games were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as things were kind of shifting more and more that direction, the Switch happened and very heavily gave a lot more momentum in favor of portable gaming. And obviously it's important not just portable gaming, but to Nintendo in general, seeing as how their last system, the Wii U, was not doing super hot. And while the 3DS was successful, it was still a smaller, more specific market than what they've really been achieving with the Nintendo Switch. I mean, it's been such a wildly successful system that a lot of games from both the 3DS and Wii U have been getting ported over or remade or getting direct sequels. The point is, the Switch has become sort of the definitive home for everything Nintendo. And then of course, alongside the importance of bringing back portability was also the extremely simple but innovative concept of the Switch marrying the concepts of portable and at-home gaming into one system that can adapt to both situations. A concept that honestly had been explored in the past before by other systems like say the Sega Nomad, but all those attempts back then were a little too ahead of their time and the technology just wasn't really user-friendly yet. Whereas with the Switch, it is a very simple, straightforward concept of Play it on the system on the go, drop it into dock when you want it on your TV. So the Nintendo Switch makes a lot of sense. It brought back an importance to portable gaming, it was a new important idea that really shaped how future consoles might be influenced, and of course, it has brought Nintendo back into really the limelight for a lot of people. So why is it important to me that these two items are on this list and that there is nothing available from PlayStation? Well, it's because PlayStation as a company, especially this last decade, has been playing things very, very safe. This isn't necessarily to say that they haven't been doing anything good, it's just that they haven't been focusing on things like innovation. Instead, the focus has been on making the best kind of traditional, run-of-the-mill game experience possible. And that was one of the big reasons why I think the PS4 had a really strong start against the Xbox One, is that while the Xbox One was trying to push this idea of bundling in the Kinect and motion controls and all kinds of crazy stuff, PlayStation just made a simple, more powerful system system with a great library of games, and that worked. But the question that this raises to me is, is this the kind of thinking that only works out in the short run, where the system right now immediately is going to do great, or does it cause a long-term stifling where, yeah, the systems are working out well, but as everyone else is trying to push the envelope further and further, will PlayStation find themselves falling behind? And to be fair, yes, PlayStation has messed around with some special ideas before, but normally it's following after other things have succeeded. The PlayStation Move on the PS3, which honestly didn't do great on its own, was based on the success of the Wii. PlayStation also had the PlayStation Portable and PlayStation Vita, following the footsteps of Nintendo's successful handhelds. And even more recently with PSVR, that was trying to kind of jump on the same craze as we saw VR headsets coming to PC. And as I've talked recently about the concept of PS5, I have seen a few people ask questions of, well, why are we assuming PlayStation is just sticking with a standard system? Could it be that they are working on something crazier? And honestly, I don't think so. I think PlayStation likes the idea of playing things safe and making a straightforward approach. In fact, even recently when topics came up about, hey, are you guys going to make a successor to the PS Vita? Are you going to do another portable? The answer was no. They didn't think people were very interested in portable systems, despite the fact the Switch has been selling insanely well. And instead, they have been focusing on everything they've been talking about with the PS5, which is all the powerful tech specs. 
And really what this all boils down to is again, that question I've been having lately of how the next generation of systems is actually gonna be received. Because you have Xbox who's been making a lot of active efforts to not only improve the accessibility of their system, but really even change the way that people approach having a gaming system with concepts like Game Pass and xCloud, and Nintendo having the huge success of their Nintendo Switch and other innovative ideas they might be working on in the future. Well, the concept of business as usual for PlayStation is working out right now, and I think they're still gonna have pretty good momentum going to the start of the next generation. I just can't help but wonder if that momentum is going to slow down more and more as the pace picks up for Xbox and Nintendo. And you know, the defense that a lot of people have against that is that, well, the big strength PlayStation has is their exclusives, which is a big strength Nintendo has as well, and the concept that there are certain properties that are always going to be just on those systems. But I just have to wonder, at what point for a regular consumer does that decision become more difficult where, sure, PlayStation has cool exclusives, but Microsoft has cooler everything else, or Nintendo has the ability of going handheld. At the end of the day, not everyone out there is going to buy every single system out there. So what becomes that final decision maker for someone? Now let's talk about the Xbox Adaptive Controller. This is something that's really important for different reasons. It's not so much about reinvigorating a particular company or bringing in a certain brand, but instead focusing on the idea of making gaming in general a lot more accessible. As the years have gone by and gaming has grown more and more, there's always been a very heavy emphasis on refining the core gameplay experience, better graphics, better controllers, but all of it's been focused on this kind of standardized experience that isn't honestly accessible to everyone out there. And this is something that the Xbox Adaptive Controller has been one of the biggest steps towards helping with. There have been other areas that gaming has been working on. We've seen more games have things like colorblind modes, subtitles are a lot more common, as well as having text that's a lot more readable, though there are some games that still struggle with that concept, Fire Emblem. But the idea is that more and more games are aware of this fact that they need to try and just do a few light changes to make them accessible to a lot more people out there and make it that it's an experience that isn't only to a few select groups. And the adaptive controller is really one of the best examples of this in the last decade, because it's not just a simple matter of a specific game added a mode or feature that was handy for certain people. It wasn't a matter of some smaller company coming up with a cool idea. It was the fact that a major brand, one of the big three companies right now when it comes to console gaming, took a conscious effort to make a controller that fits a large number of disabilities. And that is fantastic. By improving on the controller itself and actually introducing a way that people with disabilities can interface with just the entire game library in general, general opens up so many more games. And this is something that I think is very heavily indicative of what Microsoft has been doing as a game company, at least after this kind of initial problematic launch of the Xbox One, is just improving the overall experience of their system as much as possible. Not in terms of just UI and special features, as well as things like Game Pass, but by also making their system accessible to a lot more people with things like the accessibility controller. 